Welcome um, to a panel discussion on lessons learned in deploying Gen AI for HR and organizational strategy. And we're specifically going you know, to look at the role of, of people analytics in that. So those of you that saw me present this morning uh, will see, would have remembered, or may remember, maybe you've forgotten all of it already. Um, in our recent uh, research at Insight 222 on the people analytics operating model, it highlighted that in, in the most advanced people analytics teams, AI strategy and use cases are an integral part of the focus of data scientists in the teams and the analytics at, at scale teams as well. Um, so this panel discussion is going to look at the role of people analytics in helping to steer HR and people's strategy in relation to generative AI, uh, the opportunities, potential use cases, some of the challenges um, in areas such as privacy and ethics, uh, and also the build versus uh, buy debate as well. well. We'll touch on that. So let's get started. Um, so let's start around the role of people analytics. When I asked this morning who worked in people analytics, about 80% of the people in the room put their hands up. So I think everyone cares about this. So firstly, please can each of you briefly introduce yourselves and, and provide your thoughts on the role of, of people analytics in, in supporting and leading on a Gen AI efforts in HR. So I'm going to start with you, Bridie. Um, yeah, I'll go to you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Bridie. Uh, I lead the people analytics and experience team at Expedia. Um, AI is not new, right? I think uh, what is new is that Gen AI is galloping towards us at a, at a pace that we haven't seen before. And I think it's also embedding in all parts of our kind of daily personal and professional lives. And I think that's just such an amazing opportunity for us in people analytics. Why? Because we're already experts at prioritizing machine learning investments, integrating data strategies, ethical adoption of AI, et cetera. So I think this is just a great opportunity for us to be even more integral in, in terms of being a business function. And Eunice? Sure, hi everyone. Oh, okay. um, I'm Eunice, I lead the, uh, the data science research team over in the people analytics team at Merck. Some of you might know Jeremy Shapiro. Um, and um, I think, in, and I'm aligned in, his, in the, in the in Jer with Jeremy's view as well on the role of people analytics as both a translator and a guide to the HR function um, around both the technology, how it works, because we're not new to these models, just maybe this form of it, as Bridie mentioned, and also in terms of the impacts on the um, folks working in the organization. So, okay. Oh, and one kind of quick addendum is, uh, I think it's also really important for us to play the role of um, you know, teaching and coaching folks in HR of how it works, but also how it doesn't. It's evolving at a rapid rate, um, but I just think it's very important to help manage expectations about um, if, you know, if someone might think, oh, this thing that took you like three weeks before is going to take you one hour now, maybe that one hour isn't quite realistic yet. And so just being able to help coach them through and manage expectations about what the capability is today, what it will be tomorrow, I think is an important thing to help out. A little bit of expectation management. Right, perhaps. just a little bit. <laughs> and, and Anthony, if you, again, similarly, if you could introduce yourself as well and where you see the role of people analytics and generative AI and AI, perhaps. Uh, so, Anthony, you can call me Tony Ferreris. I work at Pinterest. I lead the people insights and analytics function. Um, you know, the, the benefit of going last in the panel is I can just say, I agree with everybody, <laughs> let's move on. Um, <laughs> But I do, I do agree with, with everyone. I think uh, mainly uh, for people analytics, I think it's a natural skill. Um, it's in our wheelhouse. The basis for AI or gen AI, I think, is it, we, we understand it. We know how to use it. We know how to work with it very naturally. Um, a lot of what I hear from a lot of HR professionals is that um, Sometimes leadership is kind of pushing this concept on on them, Gen AI, and assuming that it's it's a very easy thing to cut costs, um, do repeatable tasks very quickly. Um, when it's sometimes true, not all the time. What I hear from HR professionals is that it feels very unnatural to speak with Gen AI um, in a way that produces the outputs that are repeatable, reliable, uh, specific to the task or, or the need um, in such a way that it doesn't require you to pull it and edit it and do lots of different things. But for me and for my team, what Gen AI feels like is coding 
but in natural language, giving it context to provide you with the right output in the right way. And us in people analytics can lead the adoption, um, make it less of a black box, less of a mystery to HR professionals, and really create these kind of junior analysts who utilize Gen AI to improve their, their work outcomes, their efficiency. Thank you. Some good, good, great observations there. So we're, we're going to get into potential use cases now. I appreciate that you may not be able to talk about any specific things that you may or may not be doing within your relevant organization. So we're going to sort of look at it at a kind of higher level, really. So, Uni, starting with you, and Nancy, to your point, I will be swapping up who goes first. So it, it doesn't all get so easy of being last as well. Um, <laughs> where, Eunice, where do you see the main current opportunities for, for applying Gen AI in HR? Sure. And I think there are so many that it could all, almost feel like willing the ocean. But um, if I were to hone in, I think where I think most people see the, the biggest promise is uh, around just the operational efficiency gains, um, you know, for large body of, of unstructured text data. And so and, and what's great is HR has a lot of that right in the form of, you know, in for example, in the LN learning and development space or in our myriad of um, policy documents, job aids, SOPs, right? So I think there's a lot of text there that, um, that uh, where if you kind of harness Gen AI in the right way and you can really augment the processes by which, um, you know, people and in, in employees, people in the workforce who use the information in these documents can get that information and get moving much faster. Um, I think other areas that um, in our workforce analytics team that I found very relevant is in conversational business intelligence, which has been around for a while. It just wasn't that great, but I think it's been supercharged recently. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to see how that continues to develop. And something that's a little bit uh, more that I've been more involved in is around the hiring process and helping hiring managers um, and enhance their process around uh, making smarter selections, not necessarily using Gen AI, but just AI in general, and then um, draft documents um, and enhance their process around it. What's also cool is that you can use Gen AI to be a force for a DEI and inclusion and make sure that the, the language that gets drafted is also inclusive and compliant, which I think nets you a lot of more enhanced outcomes overall. So. Thanks, Eunice. And Bridie, you're going to be the unlucky one by going last here, I think, on this particular one. Anthony, maybe one or two other areas where you, where you think you could apply it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly everything that Eunice mentioned. Um, I like the concept of using it through uh, recruiting, um, even simple tasks like building for managers, building out like job descriptions and things like that. Um, my personal favorite, uh, my personal favorite for using Gen AI is as like a personal assistant for whenever I want to build out a document My um, that would normally take me a while just have Gen AI, give it the context that, that it needs to know, build out a document, a, a presentation, that sort of thing. You just need to give it the information that it needs to build it out, and then I just go in and, and edit it. For me, as a person who's grown up really just looking at data, using data, that sort of thing, it just takes me such a long time to build those things out, and I really should be spending my focus um, elsewhere. So it solves the blank page problem. Yeah. Yeah. And Friday? Yeah, so I, I think we should think about it in the same way we always think about it. You should apply it to your priorities. So that's how we're kind of choosing. We're doing rapid experimentation and then kind of thoughtful scaling on the back of that because, indeed, a lot of these applications aren't fully ready, even if the vendors say they do, my uh, no offense uh, intended. Um, so, you know, of course, if your priorities are around sourcing, that's where you can start typing in and finding candidates rather than, you know, it's just the next kind of ease of use for sources. We're looking in search and how we can improve search across the organization. We're looking in performance um, and how we can automatically generate development plans or these things, but they're all experiments at this stage. Um, what I'm quite excited about, and I keep, I feel like I repeat myself all the time, I'm really uh, excited about not having to type up insights anymore as an analyst. <laughs> Anybody else excited about that? Yes. Um, because we still spend a lot of time on that kind of storytelling on the most basic level, and that means that we can focus on storytelling on a more strategic level. I 
And I'm really excited about intelligent manager assistants. That's what I would call them. But, you know, it's nowhere near here, here for us yet. But I think the possibilities of helping managers make better decisions about their people and workforce aspects and prompt them on that is a real opportunity. Um, okay. I'm pretty good. We're gonna. I can ask you some different questions now. So hopefully, it will, it will, you know, we'll, we can cover a bit more ground then between us before we potentially open it up to to the audience. So, Anthony, maybe broadening one of the points that that Bridie made there. You know, what are some of the best practices you'd recommend um, to to the audience here for for aligning Gen AI with uh, broader organisational and business goals? Yeah, great question. First, I have to say that I'm I'm originally, or I'm, I live in LA, uh, where we have lots of earthquakes. This stage and these chairs would I'm not survive that. an earthquake because this is very <laughs> unstable. I also live on the West Coast. Don't yeah. say that. <laughs> no, and I'm glad. <laughs> but apparently, you might have hurricanes up here sometimes. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think what I've seen so far is you, as a company, mention the fact that you use AI, your stock pro price goes up. So that's, that's definitely a good um, business alignment there. Uh, but besides that, I think the, the go-to here is around efficiency and, um, and improving effectiveness and productivity, those sorts of things, which are obviously very big business goals to be had. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in those areas um, for this. It, it hits at both sides of margin. Um, finding, finding those opportunities um, to utilize Gen AI to replace some of the tasks that some roles are doing is an incredible opportunity. Um, uh, the way that I think about it and the way that I find it easy to translate how to properly um, plan for Gen AI in, in the business, um, and it's specifically in, in HR, is understand what it does, what it does well, and then look at the landscape of all the different jobs and tasks that occur within the organization. Find the opportunities that Gen AI can do well, and um, strategize around that. Think about it this way, and this really works with obviously HR people, is where can you hire Gen AI? And that seems to click. Where can we reimagine some of these roles? Slightly different way where we can hire a, a Gen AI as a consultant, as a contractor, as just a permanent doer uh, for some of these things, and again, That'll help, um, you know, in some cases reduce costs, definitely increase productivity in some areas, um, especially with me who does not like creating documents and things like that. I'll just have Gen AI do that. I'll hire Gen AI to do that for me. Pretty good. Okay. Eunice, let's, let's sort of move forward to maybe challenges around implementing, um, implementing this. What, you know, what are some of the most significant challenge maybe that you've encountered when implementing Gen AI in HR? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So while we did kind of broad experiments, like, uh, for example, that Bridie mentioned, we also kind of went deep in one particular one. And and so uh, it, it, just to depict kind of the scale, we de you know, the deployment was to um, uh, 1,700 users, and that was the pilot. So, you know, not a small thing to attempt to do um, full stack. And so I guess the challenge is around that. And uh, I'll focus on one today, but I'm also going to caveat that with um, we buy, I don't know if bypass is the right word, but the way we try to kind of manage some of the other challenges we would have encountered, which is very typical in our space around sensitive use cases and PII data, is that we tried to pick one that was a little bit less risky from that front, you know, so that we would be able to maximize our time learning and uh, the learning and iteration loops so that we could. Um, just quickly really get acquainted with the technology and learn how to deploy it in effective ways. Um, and also that we could just deploy the solution um, um, sooner rather than later. Um, so we can see, is this hitting the mark or not? Do we need to really revise our strategy of how we deploy this in our organization? Um, and so, so from that point of view, I think the, the challenges that, that I, I, I felt most uh, viscerally were around just... Um, uh, the compressed timelines, because everyone was kind of racing to deploy things, and then 
uh, the, the kind of starting point in terms of maturity of the data science capability that we had. Um, and Thank so you. if I were to, so um, I've had the opportunity to be in multiple kind of contexts deploying um, you know, machine learning models into production. And uh, I think the experience is very different depending on um, your foundational capabilities that you have or maybe don't have, and the, the readiness of your infrastructure. So these are probably not new things, but I kind of felt it very, uh, it, that it was a, a, a real challenge because we were trying to fly the plane, but I was also um, you know, building, buying, borrowing um, t uh, talent um, so that we could uh, fill out the, pr uh, the product team. Um, also, while upgrading our infrastructure, um, uh, in a very accelerated pace so that we could support tooling that would be uh, robust enough to handle um, thousands of users. So, so I would say that was the main challenge. And just to kind of put it into perspective, um, we had individuals from five different teams in IT join us and support us. They started at five different times, so that meant five different kickoffs, and just really trying to get everyone on the same page about what we were marching towards. Um, while everyone was upskilling in one or two or more ways at the same time. And so I would say that that was uh, kind of, it was very poignant at the very end when we finally made it to the finish line successfully and on time. Um, I think everyone wore a lot of hats too. So I introduced myself as a research director, but I played a product manager role and I was also uh, the delivery lead for one of the, the back end delivery team, right? So just it, there's a lot of learning and juggling um, that, that we did, but you know, it was ultimately very rewarding, but taught me a lot about what it takes to really get something out there that's um, somewhat scaled and robust enough for, for users. Yeah, very good. And I think one of the topics that you highlighted there kind of lends nicely into question for you, Bridey, um, you know, around that whole topic of data privacy and ethics, because obviously it's such an important thing with this. I mean, you, you mentioned, um, Eunice, that you deliberately picked a use case where there was going to be less discussion around that uh, particular area. So, so Bridie, can you share some specific strategies or, or, or maybe protocols you put in place to, to manage some of the risks associated with, with data privacy and ethics when it comes to this um, particular thing? Yeah. Um, firstly, we're all dying to know what the use case was, right? <laughs> Sure, you can't share. Um, it, it, was, uh, <laughs> uh, it was around job descriptions. Okay. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, so um, Expedia was one of the kind of early adopters of uh, ChatGPT when it came out on the platform, which has its kind of pros and cons uh, because soon afterwards came regulation, etc., that we therefore needed to prepare for, as all organisations did. Um, so we very quickly recognised that data like basically governance around this is one of the most important things across across the company. I'm a member of the Responsible AI Council, which is basically a, um, a cross-functional group of experts from security, uh, legal, uh, everywhere, all the big products for domains that are basically put together to advise our executive team on making sure that we're uh, managing the risks, but also the opportunities because that's the balance. I mean, Expedia believes that we should use AI and machine learning wherever we can. We're a platform company. So to enable that, we have to put some of these kind of governance processes around that. And that means that every AI application now goes through an evaluation and has a risk category. And the most high risk categories go up to this group. They look at it from different angles and then they advise the executive team whether we should be doing that. We're monitoring uh, all the open application uses of uh, AI and Gen AI across the, the organization for two reasons, to manage our risk, but also to, to really see where are our employees using uh, these tools and where is there an opportunity that we might need to have something internally available for them. Um, we're putting in place all new procurement and contractual processes. I assume this is a familiar story for everybody because all the vendors are doing new things with our data and we need to make sure that, that, that we're on top of that. So that's really one of the ways we're kind of putting in place some of those mechanisms. And then we just replicate that in the HR team or in the finance team, etc. cetera. And, and staying with you, Bridie, you know, about looking at organizational readiness now, 
you know, how do you use a people analytics leader and what is your role in, in ensuring the organization and particularly HR, I guess, and maybe the HR leadership team uh, is ready for gen AI adoption, particularly regarding things like upskilling? Yeah, so I found this question a bit of a big one. I don't know if anyone has better ideas than me, but in addition to governance, I mean, governance is so important around these things, about making sure the organization is ready and you can move fast um, and adapt. Apart from that, I mean, we are doing experimentation. I mean, I was a little bit surprised. We're a tech company, so we thought this would be easy for our employees to adopt and use in their everyday, but it's like anything. You have some early adopters and then you have some that are trying it out and not so great at it, and then some that are like, oh, hell no, I know what I'm doing, I don't need this. Um, so I think experimentation, uh, small pilots and then scaling uh, has worked for us uh, in preparing, rather than just unleashing Slack AI on the org uh, entire organization or GitHub Copilot on the, t on the uh, entire organization. We have champions. That helps uh, with adoption and understanding the application within deeper business processes, et cetera, and where some of the bottlenecks might get in the way for, for people to, to apply or use these tools. Education, I think it has to, has to be there, right? I mean, we're used to educating HR to be more data literate, data savvy. Is that evolving with these new forms of, of interactions with AI? Yes, I think we can all agree that. So what is a good prompt? When can you use this? How can you make sure that you put explainability on the outcomes uh, of these uh, tools? So I think there are some of the things we've been thinking about. I'd love to hear if anybody else has uh, good ways to ready the organization for these things. So Anthony, before I ask you the next question, is there anything you'd, you'd add to what Riley said? Because the question for you really is, now then putting that lens on the people analytics team itself, um, what does... What does Gen AI mean for the capabilities of the people analytics team? Are there any additional skills that you're looking at hiring or you've hired? But maybe you can talk to the organizational readiness piece as well in your, in your answer. I, I think it's the facilitation to help the organization adopt um, or our team adopt. I think that's a, a very specific skill around like change management, those sorts of things. With regards to Gen AI itself, I, I think it does bring in the consideration of how how do we talk to it? How do we interact with it in such a way that brings about the right outcome, the right output? Um, minimize hallucinations and bring it to, uh, bring the most value out of, of it. And it, it's, that is, and I've said this before is that, um, it's uncomfortable for some people to interact like that. The way that I generally um, communicate or translate, like how do you speak with Gen AI or how do you work with an AI to Im improve it, um, improve the output of it is um, I have a five-year-old and you know the way that I interact with it is with him is the same way I might interact with Gen AI is I encourage it. I tell it you you're gonna be great. You're gonna be the best learning and development leader in the whole wide world and you have all this experience um, with with all this. Um, now tell me with this context, what should I do? You know, in those sorts of situations. It's, it's some people what hits really well is um, Pretend that you are hypnotizing someone. You're asking this person to uh, not be a people analytics leader, but an astronaut. How would you how would you encourage them? How would you bring to their mind the the things, the context that would allow this person to be an expert in in that area, and then ask it its question, the questions that you need um, to bring about the value, and that is oddly a a skill. I think one of the things that people say is that you just kind of interact with it. That's not really you interact with it in a slightly different way than what you think. We're going to do one section now around working with external technology partners and the whole build versus buy conversation. And then we're going to get to the audience. So if you've got questions, do ready yourselves and hands and the people will be walking around in a minute. So, so Eunice, starting with you, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about maybe build versus buy when it comes to developing Gen AI products in HR or, or how you're working with your, your 
technology partners to to, to Bridie's point that she made a mm -hmm. few minutes Absolutely. ago. Can I add to the I no, know you, you everyone can add to that already well. answered it, but it's a flexible one, panel. <laughs> just around the you know uh, what what might help drive adoption of you know Gen AI technologies. Um, just and this is from a little bit of a different angle than use the existing kind of interface, you know, Chat GPT lookalike or whatever you have in your you know enterprise. Uh, I think from a if you are in you know in a position where you can build you know a small large tool, um, I think I think uh, I worked very closely with user experience researchers and designers, and uh, interviewed hundreds of stake like oh actually I shouldn't exaggerate at least a hundred stakeholders. Um, um, people who would be using the tool, people who might have a say in not letting others use the tool. So, so like it was very much built from the ground up kind of by them. I mean, there were some kind of initial things that needed to happen in terms of the design, but beyond that, um, just because it was such an iterative process involving end users from the beginning, the adoption has been like super around the question around, you know, do you have any trouble using it? Or is there anything stopping you from using it? It has been like an almost 100%. No one has problems. Everyone finds it super easy like mm. to, to adopt. Um, now, I haven't heard from every single one of our um, end users, but um, I, I thought that was an interesting kind of thing to reflect on. Um, and what eases the tension of adop adopting new technology, something even as, I think, as easy as you know, ChatGPT or that that chatbot interface. So that was an interesting learning. Um, when it comes to build versus buy, I think it's it's always a hard question, and the answer is always it depends. Um, but in but if I were to just kind of take a step back from the Gen AI piece and and just examine the build versus buy, I think I would typically start with with well, is building this with the question of, is building this really aligned to the core competencies of my company or my context? Um, which often it might not be, but I think the next, there are a couple of scenarios where it makes sense to do, uh, which kind of apply to some of the things that we did, which is first, do you have access to data that's gonna be really useful in solving the problem that maybe a vendor doesn't have, either because it's not HR data and you're not going to convince finance anytime soon to give their data up, right, or real estate. Um, or is the data so sensitive, even though it is HR data, that there's no way the company is going to be willing to take that risk to let it out of the organization? So I think in cases like that, there's a really good opportunity to, to build something that adds a lot of value that's kind of unique. And um, the other, um, I think, aspect is around um, the requirements. So some problems are are great for general purpose solutions that a vendor is going to be very much positioned well to deliver on. But sometimes the requirements of um, users or the business are so precise and nuanced that it makes much more sense to pursue a build and um, a tailored solution. Um, so I think those are two kind of general ideas around the build versus buy and why a buy might make sense. When it comes to Gen AI, though, what makes it really interesting is how experimental the technology is. And I think uh, for that reason, I think everyone should be at least doing experimental builds. It doesn't have to be, you know, production. It doesn't have to like replace a process. Uh, but I think the the value of doing the builds right now and experimenting internally is that uh, you build that technical muscle that's going to be really important. Um, especially because the technology is evolving and you don't know just how that's going to change and maybe kind of close the gap between you building something that actually meets. Uh, a need or solves a problem that you've had for a long time. Um, it also is going to teach you about how um, about other use cases that might be really great to solve because now you know how it works um, a little bit better than you did before. Um, you can now, uh, yeah, so use it to spot other use cases, use it to apply to other use cases and solve things. So the generalized kind of framework that you develop by working with it directly is helpful. And then lastly, around um, you know even vendor solutions, technology solutions, I think there is, um, as probably you're all keenly aware, the EOC guidance says that ultimately the company and not the vendors are liable for the outcomes of the use of an AI tool. And so when you think about that, and I'll I'll talk about another point that's related to it, but I think that's where you want to have a very robust testing framework and an evalu evaluation framework um, and governance right around the things that are coming in 
And so I think having that technical muscle and internal capability, having experimented with builds, really helps you come up with better questions, better framework, better tests. Um, and then the other angle to why I think it's important to you know, really do some Gen AI building is around um, the transparency and control. The models that we are using um, in the people analytics space and just in the world have grown you know, in, in terms of sophistication, performance, right, from statistical models to machine learning models to now deep learning models. What's, what's the inverse relationship, though, has been with um, the uh, explainability or interpretability of these models. And so if we now realize you know, that we're dealing with these black box models, I think um, where you do still have some control um, and, uh, and leverage, especially because these models are very powerful in doing like, you know, things that might incur bigger risk is, the, is that an internal build lets you really identify or diagnose issues when they come up or even know, detect it, um, because you've set up the systems too, because you were worried about it, you know, X, Y, Z things. And so you need to set it up and then being able to um, like fix it much faster than maybe if it were in kind of a more general purpose tool. So I think those are that control and transparency is, um, is, a, is a big reason why I think for some of the more sensitive things, use cases you have, it might be better really to work internally. Um, but that said, I've, I have just been scanning the landscape and just noting that things are changing so quickly in terms of all the different players working on solving different problems. And so I think it's really important at this stage uh, uh, in terms of the build and buy question of Gen AI to just keep an open mind. Maybe something you built that solves something today might later be solved in a better way in a more cost-effective way later. So I think there is some credence to just keeping a very open mind, monitoring the landscape. And if you're building, to build small releases um, incrementally um, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really comp good, good answer, I think, and helpful. Right. Do we have any questions? We've got time for two questions, I think. Yes, at the front here. Bridie, um, how do you think, or how can you harness or sort of monitor the employee use of, you know, AI? I know you talked about it, but how do you really feel confident about keeping tabs on it or having a good situation all around? Yeah, so we're just tracking and monitoring when they're using it within our domain. Uh, so on their, like, laptops or whatever. Um, we're monitoring what they're using and why they're using because we're looking to see, uh, to make sure that they're not uploading our data, et cetera, in, in, inside that. That's part of our privacy statements that we track and monitor these kind of things so employees are aware. Um, and what we were surprised to see was that the biggest uh, uh, case that they're using it for is related to software development. So that's something we, we aren't solving internally because we have a gigantic uh, group of software engineers. So we really need to make sure that um, we have internal tools that are safe to use uh, or internal applications that they can use uh, to, to solve these things. Yeah. And one more question before we have a quick fire round to finish. Yes, that. Hi, I heard you guys talk about the usage, but how about the fact of these AI models are built potentially on biased data. How would you guys go about making sure that you address that or caveat it in an uh, intelligent way? He wants to take that one. I, <laughs> I, think I can, you, but also, yeah, go, oh, please, sorry. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think you also have the issue of, um, uh, what do they call it, the compounding effect of when it starts generating things and then using its generation of it continuously and it's just becoming like a, what is it? Doom loop, yeah, doom loop. Um, I, I I think that's one of the the things that uh, there needs to be some sort of like internal kind of regulation around, like what is it actually using. Um, but I, I think ultimately, though, uh, with with AI or Gen AI, I think the most value that you're going to get get from it is some sort of blend of the external data, but also the internal data that you have. And the internal data that you have is what you have the most control over. So as long as it's not recre or creating and then adding and compounding and all those sorts of things, and you force it to focus on, you know, cer uh, certain data frames or certain data then it should be OK. The, the, I think the only problem is then how do you get it to continuously learn by itself. Um, but that's definitely, I mean, it, we're still in the early stages of this, so we'll continuously have to learn about what to do. 
So quick fire round to finish. One sentence. <laughs> Good Friday. I'm go I won't come to you first, so Friday. Uh, <laughs> I'll come to you this. So the question is, you've been asked to put together um, a Gen AI for HR uh, strategy by the CHRO. What's the first thing you first thing you do? Oh, this is a different question than we discussed. It is. It is. <laughs> we are not prepared no idea. For this. Yeah, like, let's go, Eunice. Uh, We're out of here. So, someone else want to go? The, the you know that has an answer. Can you repeat this? <laughs> I tell you what. Why don't I do one be fan? Why don't I do one fan? Pete, can you each share one thought each on the likely future direction of Gen AI with regards to people analytics? Sorry, Eunice. I'll let you go first on that one. <laughs> um, the future of Gen AI. Um, can I can I share more of an aspiration, an yeah, opportunity? That's so fine. yeah. So I think. Um, so I think a lot of the conversation we hear talk, you know, is around, oh, the opportunities, right? The efficiency gain, the productivity gain. And then there's also some fear that I hear, oh, it's biased. It's, um, there's safety issues, alignment issues. But then I think um, one thing that recently um, re-peaked my interest while working on um, this deployment, these deployments, is uh, around um, the design of AI systems and how they can be, they can, they can be very intentionally designed to be human-centric. And um, let me just, I, I wrote that, jotted down the definition of human-centric design. It's, it's when you think about um, designing our systems to drive not just an efficiency outcome, but also like a human well-being outcome, right? How can you enhance uh, humans' uh, lives and well-being? Well -beings? And I think it's relevant because, especially because we are in the business of HR and we want to think about how jobs are designed and how systems are designed that impact the people we work with in a way that's continuing to help them thrive and be well. Um, and sometimes I think over-indexing on just efficiency as a, as a kind of performance metric results in designs that may not actually... Um, that that you know oftentimes leads people to talk about replacing humans or you know or kind of diminishing their worth or value. And so I, I I'm going to end with a little story, which is that um, one of the pieces of feedback that I got from our users that was the most kind of delightful to receive and, and made me very motivated to continue this work is that we have these end users around the world for whom English is not a, a native language. And they were saying, thank you for giving me access to this tool because it has made me empowered and feel included in a way that I hadn't before in this organization. And so I think that um, really speaks to the fact that it doesn't have to be just one way that things are designed. Every, you know, even when you're talking about agentic workflows, which are, you know, I know, you know, very much like on the scene, they don't have to be, you know, they can be designed to optimize for multiple outcomes. So that's, that's what I'll Thank you for pushing back on my... <laughs> ad hoc question so we've got the human centricity there yeah. Anthony uh, I think if we take hold of it as people in Linux I think it brings us even closer to um, bridging the gap across the different kind of COEs within HR and in really enhancing strategy as long as we I mean I think it's like I said before it's such a natural um product tool for us to take that ownership um, for. So if, if we do that, it just brings us closer to to that center table. And Bridie, you get the final word. Uh, oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. What, what, I, what I sometimes think about is, you know, we're going to go through the hype with this. We're going to hit despair because we're going to realize <laughs> <laughs> that we still have privacy challenges. Right. Our That's employees a good one. still want, don't want us to do this. HR still needs to be educated on how to be digitally savvy. So uh, whilst this is huge developments for, for the, the HR function, for productivity, for our function, for the business at large, uh, we still have some steps to go and we need to stay focused on uh, keeping our organizations you know, ahead of these developments. Um, to manage the risk, but also to grab the opportunity. And, and we shouldn't forget that data, 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 this is not gonna solve our data challenges and we have to be good at understanding our data pipelines and how that relates to, to outcomes, despite the technologies we're using to, to serve it up. Fantastic. Bridie, Tony, Eunice, thank you very much indeed. Great discussion. Thank you.